Hello, everyone. Hello, Master. It's time again for us to learn the Earth Store Bodhisattva's Vow Sutra. First, let's review the origin of this sutra. About the origin of the sutra, I have put it into two words, filial piety. That's about Sakyamuni Buddha teaching Dharma to his mother. He taught his mother Dharma because he wished his mother could elevate from the Trayastrimsa to higher heavens or even be liberated from reincarnation in the six realms. What is true filial piety to parents? It is helping parents achieve the ultimate enlightenment. That's true filial piety and loving care. It's not only satisfying their desires by buying them what they love to eat and taking care of them for little things. Of course, taking delicate care for little things in their lives is important. Earth Store Bodhisattva's mother was in hell twice previously. She'd even fallen into the incessant suffering hell with no way out. Earth Store Bodhisattva did good deeds for his mom to save her. And that's showing his filial piety. So the origin of this sutra is filial piety and compassion. We all have biological parents giving birth to and nurturing us. So the teachings in this sutra are related to each of us. Bodhisattva's mother was born a Brahmin girl in one life. As you know, Brahmin was a noble class in ancient India a divinity family. Since his mother was born a Brahmin in such a religious family, she didn't believe in Buddha and even slandered the three jewels. So after his mother died, she fell into the evil realms and the incessant suffering hell. Earth Store Bodhisattva looked like an ordinary girl at that time. She loved her mother very much and wanted to know where she was. That was true love. If that was not true love, she'd care only when she was alive, such as if she had seen the doctor, or had enough food and clothes. That's what filial piety means for normal people. Once she passed away, it didn't matter if she went to heaven or hell. Nobody cares, they can't even care. That's the common concept. It's exactly what we have to focus on. Earth Store Bodhisattva was different. He wanted to know where exactly his mother went after she passed. He sold his house, built Buddhist temples, made offerings and did good deeds. Before the Awakening Blossom Samadhi Mastery King Tathagata, he sincerely prayed to know the place that his mother had gone to. Later, in the meditative state, the girl saw poisonless Ghost King in hell. Ghost King told her that the merits of her offering had helped her mother be reborn in the heavenly realm. The Brahmin girl was deeply moved and made the great vow. That in the infinite future, she would help all sentient beings. So now we know it. Next is the story of Bright Eyes. Bright Eyes' mother was also deceased. Bright Eyes offered the Arhat good food. 
Arhat saw her mother was still in the evil realm and suffering. Her mother fell into hell because she had eaten fish, crabs, shrimp, etc. She ate much seafood, all that was alive and fresh of various kinds. What made it typical was that her mother loved to eat fish roe. She enjoyed eating it so much, which finally made her fall into hell. Her filial daughter wanted to save her. She sculpted the statue of pure lotus eyes to Thagata, did lots of good deeds and made offerings to save her mother. After being saved, her mother wasn't elevated to higher levels. Since she was in the evil hell, she couldn't be liberated so easily. Doing good deeds and selling properties were still not enough to make up for her mother's karmic debts. When you owe one million but return half a million, you don't clear all debt. The mother reincarnated as the child of a maid of her family. She was born in a lower class and would only live for 13 years. Then, Bright Eyes made a great vow to save all sentient beings in the evil realms. She said, I'll achieve Buddhahood after all sentient beings have made it. She made such a great vow. Pure Lotus Eyes Tathagata told Bright Eyes that due to her great vow and big compassionate heart, after the 13 years of her mother's life, her mother would be reborn as a self-cultivator and live for 100 years. After she finished the life as a cultivator, she would be reborn in paradise. And that's the previous life of Earth Store Bodhisattva. He was filial to his mother and saved her from hell. He sold his properties and assets to make offerings to Buddha and the Sangha, to build temples and pagodas, and to do charities and good deeds. What he did deeply moved Buddhas, so they saved his mother. It was truly showing great filial piety. It doesn't matter in which profession, people will always brag that. I am a virtuous person. I'm a righteous and loyal person. I'll do everything for my friends. Right? Everybody loves hearing nice words. It's the human touch, but its truth is not understood by people because no one teaches it. Regarding the truth, it's all based on a foundation. The foundation is to be filial to our parents. An old saying, filial piety tops all good deeds. Among millions of virtues, filial piety tops everything else. Your filial piety is the foundation of becoming a moral person. Imagine that you're powerful outside and always do your best to help others. But at home you curse and beat your parents. Will you be considered a nice person? You're just a villain who has no morality. When you need me, you can even kneel and bow to me. When you're rich and don't need me, you may even kill me. You become such a cheap, untrustworthy and immoral villain. To practice filial piety, we should love and care for our parents with a truly grateful heart, returning their fostering. That's the basic, reasonable, cultured morality. It's extremely important. Let's review the second important point. 
it's the cause and effect. Simply put, what goes around comes around. And that is causality. Of course, some of our behaviors are neither good nor bad. Through different Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, and Ghost King's teachings, we've learned the retribution of doing bad deeds and the rewards of doing good deeds. Today, we must clarify and affirm the incessant sins. Understand the sins that those in the incessant suffering hell committed. Frankly, no one will kick you to that hell. But if you've committed such sins, even in this human world, you'll be punished physically and mentally. First of all, killing or ill-treating your parents is unforgivable by the law of heaven. You'll be sent to the incessant suffering hell and never liberated. Next, harming the Buddha's body, slandering the three jewels, and disrespecting the Buddhist sutras. Then, invading and destroying temples, ruining sutras and Buddha statues. Next, seducing the monks and humiliating the nuns. The monks and nuns shouldn't commit sexual acts. Whether you force or seduce them, you commit sin. Also, killing, harming, beating, or cursing the Sangha are prohibited and considered to be big crimes. Also, if pretending to be the Sangha, invading and keeping their venues and assets, you must go to the incessant suffering hell, and some want to get famous for their fame and offerings, they cheat Buddhist practitioners. Some claim to be Buddhist, but don't follow the precepts. For those Buddhists who are ordained, no matter male or female, for the male as monk and the female as nun, if they don't follow the precepts or even do bad deeds, they'll fall into hell. For all the money and goods that are offered to the Buddha and Sangha, if one wants to steal, invade, swindle, or rob them, without the agreement of the person in charge, even if they take home and bring back silently, their behaviors are considered to be stealing, even for what you donated in the past. If you regret the donation later and take it back secretly, because you don't want to be looking bad to others, that'll be called stealing. Remember, no matter it's in the past or nowadays, anything that is donated, now by law is called donation. You may call it giving, charity or offering to Buddha. Anyway, it's a donation. Once it's donated, it's not yours. If you take it home secretly because you're unhappy, you're harming Buddha's body and blood. Bodhi meditation is a venue for true practice with strong energy. Even the water or an apple here will benefit our health. I just haven't told you before. You cannot take it away silently. It's considered to be stealing. It's a serious act of hurting Buddha's body and blood. There are more behaviors that will gain serious karma, such as humiliating those who make offerings. Say, you humiliate someone who makes offering to the three jewels. Slandering is also a serious crime. Once fallen into hell, one will only reincarnate within different hells, such as from the incessant suffering hell to the Avicii hell, and to the eye-gouging hell, tongue-plowing hell, tendon-pulling hell.
and bone cracking hell, etc. There are all kinds of torments in those hells, but no way out. Also, those that kill tend to have a short life. After our thorough research, we found that not only will they live a short life, but also have genetic problems. Say, your child looks like you, or your spouse, or both families. The child may look like his father but have his mother's personality. Your child inherits your DNA. However, if the bad karma has been imprinted in your DNA, it will be a big problem. For example, the father died at 35, his children inherited his genes and usually, they'll be short-lived too. Well, regarding the retribution, I'm not going to talk about it now. Not at this time. If you want to know more, listen to my teachings on previous chapters. You should listen to them repeatedly and remember them clearly. We have talked about the bad deeds and retribution. Let's talk about the good deeds. For example, when we see earth store bodhisattva's image, or hear his name, we reverently praise and worship him, or recite the earth store sutra. Most importantly, we make offerings to earth store bodhisattva, and we can donate to the Buddhist venues with lots of money. Also, we can donate toward rebuilding a Buddhist pagoda. We can contribute wholly or partially to building Buddha statues. Say, it will cost $100,000 to build a statue, and you contribute $8,000. These are all very good deeds, making offerings of precious things. Fragrant flowers and even good food are also welcome. People can sculpt or draw earth store bodhisattva's statue or image. Recite the sutra and cultivate with proper cultivation method. Doing these good deeds, we may gain about 28 or more benefits. Let me read them to you. 1. Receive the protection of heavenly beings and dragon-like beings. They belong to heaven. Unlike the celestial beings, gods, deities and goblins, they're capable and have great supernatural power. 2. Their virtuous karma will increase daily. 3. Accumulate superior causes for holiness. 4. Never regress from the way of enlightenment. Many people learn Buddhism. But once they lose their initial interest, they put it down and forget it. Your high mental state and compassionate heart will also regress. If you always do good deeds, you won't regress. 5. Abundant in food and clothing. Everybody needs them. It's not easy to be abundant in food and clothing. Indeed, it means being rich and prosperous. Many people live in poverty for life. They want to make money by all means, good or bad. They just want to get wealthier. So, if we cultivate properly, we'll gain such reward, abundance of food and clothing. 6. We'll not get any kind of diseases. 7. Will not be in disasters of flood or fire. 8. Will not be burglarized or robbed. 9. Will be admired and respected by people. 10. Deities and ghosts will help and support them. 11. Women, who wish to, will be reborn as men. 12. Women, who wish to, will be reborn as women. And they will be daughters of kings or ministers. 13. 
will be born with dignified and perfect appearance. Many try hard to make themselves more beautiful, such as losing weight and spending lots of money on cosmetics. They spend more on their faces than on food. 14. Will frequently be reborn in the heavens. 15. May be reborn as kings or emperors. 16. Will attain the power of knowing their past lives. They'll know the matters of the past. 17. Wishes will be fulfilled. All you wish will get a good answer and result. 18. Families and relatives will be joyful. 19. Sudden calamities will be eliminated. It's very important. 20. All the previous bad karma will be eliminated. All the bad karma in the past will be removed. Because you've done the good deeds that eliminated your bad karma, you won't fall into hell and will have a good future. 21. Will always arrive at their destination safely. Of course, you're an auspicious person. 22. Will sleep peacefully without nightmares. 23. Deceased ancestors will leave the three evil realms. You see, if you achieve enlightenment, not only will you be auspicious, but also all your ancestors will be liberated. 24. Will be reborn many times with blessings and live joyfully. Because you're a blessed and virtuous person, every time you reincarnate, you'll live a joyful life. 25. Will be praised by all holy ones. 26. Will be intelligent and have keen faculties. 27. Will have great compassion on all suffering beings. 28. Will ultimately achieve Buddhahood. This is so important. It's the ultimate liberation. Nothing is more important than that. Let's talk about more details. In a person's lifetime, there are two crucial points. When a woman gives birth, to get protection and blessings from the god of the ground, her family should not kill but do good deeds. Then, both the mother and baby will be safe and at peace. This is a practical way to be. They should also be grateful to the god of the ground. Normally, the new mother would be physically weak and need to be replenished. Also, the new mother needs to provide enough milk to feed the baby. Killing a livestock animal or a hen is what people usually do. Some said, my mother-in-law kills a hen for me every day. It may show your mother-in-law's kindness to you, but it's killing. When celebrating the full month and 100 days of the new baby, people tend to kill livestock and invite guests. It's not appropriate to celebrate a new baby's birth by killing. Doing that will impact both the mother and the new baby. Since killing is a sinful behavior, it might affect the child's health and fate. It also affects the mother's health and future. For the new baby's good, we can recite the Earth Store Sutra within seven days after the child's birth. Or, we chant Earth Store Bodhisattva's holy name 10,000 times. Earth Store Bodhisattva's heart mantra works too. The baby's previous bad karma will be eliminated. So the baby can grow in peace, living a healthy, joyful and long life. These are what we should do for the newborn baby and mother. Next, I'll talk a little more about the two ends of a lifetime. After being born, one comes to the end of life very soon. When one is dying, their family should do more good deeds for them to gain merits. 
The merits bring these benefits. 1. Won't fall into hell. 2. Will be reborn to good places or wealthy families. They should make light offerings, recite the sutras, and do good deeds for the dying person. Also, they should donate the person's beloved assets, such as money, house, and properties, also called real estate. That is a relatively large financial offering that can counteract and offset the sins of the deceased. The purpose is to prevent them from falling into serious hells, such as the Avicii hell and incessant suffering hell. Also, if the dying person can chant to Buddha, or relatives can chant for them and let them hear the chanting. When one is dying, don't kill or try to seek help from other wicked or evil ways. Doing that will increase the sinful karma for the dying person. It's extremely crucial for a deceased person that the family do good deeds within the first 49 days after their death. They can make offerings, chant, feed the Sangha, build temples, sculpt statues, etc. Because after 49 days, within 49 days, the king of hell will be checking the deceased's account, that is, calculating the merits and sins in their lifetime. After the 49 days, the king of hell gets the verdict. So within 49 days, if there are merits coming in which offset the bad karma, the king of hell won't send the deceased to the incessant suffering hell. It will be like that. So doing good deeds within the first 49 days is very crucial. Someone asked, what if the family doesn't believe in anything? Neither Buddhism nor Taoism. And after he passed away, no one would do any good deeds for him. In fact, there are many such cases. It worries people, indeed. I mentioned this situation earlier. You can prepare in advance by doing good deeds for yourself. You can make a donation, light offering, recite sutras, sculpt Buddha statues, and build venues. You can accumulate merits and virtues for yourselves. When the time comes, as mentioned in the Sutra of Contemplation, you'll see Buddha coming to pick you up, so you won't be scared. Right. You'll be leaving auspiciously, without any pain or struggle. Most dying people see the evils coming to seize them. They struggle because they are scared. You must pave a liberation road for yourself ahead of time. You must have such savings for yourself. Right. It's also doing a convenient reminder for the deceased. It also benefits people with various obstacles in their lives. Many say, whatever I do, there are always troubles and bad luck. There are such people. For example, they're sickly. They have a broken family or constant misfortunes. Therefore, you should, when you see Earth Store Bodhisattva's statue or hear his name, chant sincerely. Especially, you need to recite the sutras and Buddha's holy name. Then all your problems and misfortunes will gradually be resolved. You start to live a better life and may slowly become rich, happy, and joyful. The Buddha also taught the rich and noble people. You should donate. You have power and are very rich. You have to give to the poor and tell them why you do that. 
You have to speak warm and kind words. Don't scare people. Be humble. Don't speak like you're giving orders. You should speak gently with soft and comforting words. Such generosity gains immeasurable merits and virtues. You'll definitely elevate to higher realms when you die in the future. In the Sutra, the Buddha also reminded us the merits of dedication. When we make offerings, donate to build and repair temples, help in printing Buddhist sutras, etc. If we would dedicate the merits to family and loved ones, we'd live joyfully in three lifetimes. But if we dedicate to the Dharma realm, we'll gain the merit of living joyfully in thousands of lifetimes. It's a very, very long time. Also, after such dedication, you'll gain immeasurable merits and virtues. Ultimately, you'll achieve Buddhahood. The reward of dedication to the Dharma realm is unexpectedly huge. You should have learned that now. I just briefly and generally explained all the key points in this sutra to you as a reminder. Good day, Master. In the conclusion today, Master mentioned the origin of this sutra is filial piety. Would you please explain to us in more detail? Is there big and small filial piety? Also, in our daily life, how can we do better to show our big filial? Every family is different. Each has its own ways and problems. But there is a lot in common. The big filial could be helping your parents achieve Buddhahood and gain the greatest liberation. Right? Help them go to heaven and paradise. These are the big ones. What are the small ones? Say, your father loves red cooked pork and rice wine. Then, during the new year and festivals, you'll buy them for your father to enjoy. Because he loves those foods, he'll be happy when seeing you with them. He would tell his friends that you're a filial child. As his child, you feel happy too, but actually, you don't even know if it's filial or not. Is it true or fake filial? You feel a little uneasy. In our last lesson, I mentioned a friend in New York. After she learned Dharma from me, she wanted to show her gratitude to her father, while forgiving the huge harm her father did to her and her family. After learning, she realized, her father might do wrong things, but he loved her and her family after all. She knew that he still loved her despite what he did to others. Parents usually treat their kids with true love, right? After the course finished, she visited her father in New York. She tried hard to find where he was living. When she saw him in a small house, she felt sad. She bought some food and clothes for him. Her father asked, Why didn't you come to see me for so long? She told him the truth. After learning from me, she knew that her father still loved her. Her father said, Well, it's all right. Then, he said, If you're really a filial child, you know that I like to smoke. It means drug. If you can buy a couple for me, then you're a filial child. If you don't buy me that, I don't think you're truly filial. The father had driven her crazy. She asked me, what should I do? If I don't buy it for him, I'm not filial but sinful. All children are afraid of being accused of unfilial conduct by their parents. You'll feel bad and in pain. Right? So, this lady was in such pain and asked me what to do. If she bought it for him, it's a crime and harming her father. 
If she didn't buy it, she was not filial. She kept asking, and I said, it's your mentality. In your heart, you're grateful to him and filial. But now your father is wrong. He gave you a life, that fact doesn't mean he's enlightened. He loves you, but that doesn't mean he's right. You should be grateful to your parents for their love and care. When he made some wrong choices in his life, and did wrong things, as a filial daughter, you should have stopped your father. Of course, you can't help him to do wrong by buying him drugs. Is it harming him or helping him? Of course, it's harming. I said it's harming because he's addicted to it. It's called an addiction to vice. Shall we just let his vice grow? No. Don't be afraid that he'll scold you. You have to speak nicely and gently to your father. You must show up in person. She did that in the end. She bought him the food he loved. At least, she didn't bring her father the drugs. Later, their relationship did improve. Better yet, she helped her father quit drugs. Finally, he really quit. This is true filial piety, but it's still not the biggest one. Anyway, it's true filial piety. You're helping your seniors and parents get back on track and not go astray. You're truly a filial daughter. Such cases are quite common in our daily life. We also need wisdom to be filial. Only talking dharma and karma is not enough. Master, please tell us more about this. Since our friends online are mostly females, many of them believe in Buddha and love self-cultivation. They may face a problem in common. When they get married, they may have to face their in-laws. For most married females, the relationship with their mother-in-law is not that smooth. You can talk about anything with your own mother but not your mother-in-law. Especially if they live together, it's easy to have arguments. The father-in-laws seem to be easier. The mother-in-laws are usually stricter. They think they do everything better than their daughter-in-laws such as cooking, taking care of the family, teaching the children, and handling many other things. It's true that your knowledge base is smaller, because you're at least 20 years younger. It's just not the same. And, the parents-in-law are looking into the details. Thus, it's easier to raise conflicts and create opposing emotions and behaviors. Of course, every family has to properly deal with it. When the daughter-in-law can't convince the in-laws, she can ask her children, who are their grandchildren, to help in resolving the problem with them. One word from the grandson beats 100 words from you. Understood? Right. Whatever the grandchildren do is all right with the grandparents. Even if they do wrong, the grannies will ignore their fault. If what they say is reasonable, they will take it as truth, and even an imperial edict. So it's better to let their grandkids or sons, or someone they like, speak to them. Also, you have to be persistent and learn to be tolerant. It's a must if you want to be an all-compassionate person. No matter who you help, you're probably blamed by them, instead of being praised. It's quite a common situation. So it's easier to help others than to help your own family. That is, the closer you are, the further your heart is. Let me teach you a method. When your family always hears others praising you, they may tend to accept what you tell them, got it? When you talk with your family, always be gentle. 
Make it a habit, and it'll be easier to talk about things. If you always get into conflicts when talking with your family, it'll be hard for them to listen to you. Always mind your attitude. When talking to your in-laws and family members, it's important. During Master's lectures, many friends have reflected on themselves. They knew they had lots of wrongdoings, even big crimes before. What should they do to resolve the bad karma caused by such sins? I just remembered. I've experienced a story. We tried to build a new center overseas. Everybody was making contributions and collecting funds to build the venue. That was not easy. There was a family. The parents wanted their child to come to Bodhi and do some good deeds with us. Some foreign people also wanted to contribute to building the venue. There was a sum of money, about 100,000 US dollars. Due to the complexity of the event, it wasn't as simple as we thought. At that time, we needed a bank account to receive the money via wire transfer. The organization couldn't accept the money from overseas. It was inconvenient, so we asked a middleman to receive money for us. Right. His parents benefited from Bodhi meditation. His mother couldn't walk well and came to Bodhi. After my blessing, she could walk. Then she practiced and regained her health. The son didn't get into a university. He was a bit messed up. He was like going a bit astray. So his parents pushed him to learn from me. They hoped that I could help him. Regarding the money, we asked him to receive it for us through his account. One day, he told me, Master, I've received the money, how do we spend it? I said, wait until the registration is done, we'll deposit the money. One month later, he disappeared, hiding somewhere. His phone was off when we called him. I asked his parents where he was. We were about to ask you, Master. I said, he just left us without any notice. The parents said, we don't know either. I asked them twice, but they were getting upset and said, don't bother us anymore. We guarantee he's not a bad guy. We won't ask anyone anymore. He was with you and now he's missing. He didn't come home. So please don't ask us anymore. I was, indeed, quite upset at that time. I told the parents. A grain of rice from Buddha is bigger than Mount Sumeru. As long as you're alive, dare to spend it. Two and a half years later, the son's body was found by the police overseas. No one witnessed how he died. Of course, I must declare that I didn't curse him. I wouldn't ask someone to beat him, and I'm not supposed to do that. If he swindled, the Buddha and the Dharma protectors were watching. Someone would do the job. Among the many heavenly dragons, they're not that easygoing. If they see you doing evil, they can do 100 times more evil than you. They killed him. The earlier you learn Buddha Dharma and understand the truth, the earlier you persist in doing right things, that will keep you safe. If you've made these mistakes, how to remedy? In the sutras, the Buddha told us already, one, repent. Two, you have to take practical action. 
to do good deeds and offerings, you can build the Buddha's gold body, sculpt Buddha statues or paint Buddha's image. You can also make offerings to the Three Jewels, chant and recite sutras, make offerings to Thangas, offer lights, food, flowers, fruits, clothes, precious things and money. Right. If you've made big mistakes, you have to do more. Simply put, you have to give more money. Say, you swindled others and got one million dollars. You can't keep this money. You have to use it all to make offerings. Don't forget about the interest. The ratio of the deed you do and the retribution is 1 to 10, 0, 0, 0, right? For example, you cheated one million dollars from others. Have the people who were cheated committed suicide? Has the family who was cheated become crazy? I've seen that. The one who was cheated became crazy. She was in Taiwan. She was about 50 years old. She wanted to buy a bigger house. Because her family lived in a small house. She wanted to switch to a bigger place in Taipei. She saved the money. The swindler called and pretended to be a government official. The swindler got her information and took her money. She became demented, just like a lunatic. You see the harm is almost as big as a homicide. You have to gain merits by doing good deeds. Just repenting is not enough. You don't make new sins when you stop, but the harm caused by your previous bad deeds was huge. Even if you donate all of the cheated money, it's not enough to counteract your sin. I think you must do good deeds wholeheartedly. After you donate the money, you still do good deeds. Our meditation centers offer you places to serve, repent and do good deeds. When you're working, don't be pampered. You forget that you're a criminal. Or you might grumble that the lunch is not tasty. You have to do good deeds, instead of just thinking about doing. You must do good deeds to make up for your past sins. Many years ago, when I was small and with my master, my master helped an old man. He was 70 years old and suffering from liver disease. It was cirrhosis. Anyway, the doctor said there was no cure. Yours is almost like cancer. You better enjoy the next short period. What's to enjoy? Once you hear that news, who can still enjoy life? Luckily, the local people believed in Buddha. He was introduced to my master. When he came, he was riding on a carriage. He entered the house supported by two people. I remember, at that time, his face was ugly yellow. He couldn't even speak clearly. His wife said that he spoke loudly before. Now, when he arrived at our place, his voice was very low. He didn't mean to, but he lost his voice. What to do? His wife said, since he got this disease and is already 70 years old, we just pray he is reborn in good places. Wishing that. We have a saying locally. That, if you have a mental problem and liver disease, that's because you've done many killings. Everybody still believes this saying. So, we're wishing that he won't fall into hell and suffer every day. She hoped my master could bless him and eliminate his sins. Master said, sure. You come to work for me. I was small then, I thought. He needs people to support him. You put him to work? He's already 70 and has cirrhosis. He can't even bend down. How can he work? Since there were lots of livestock animals, there was a lot of feces next to our venue. A laborer used to pick up the feces and throw it into an excreta pit. 
the local farmers would use the feces as fertilizer. The laborer also chopped firewood and made coal balls. Someone sent my master some coal powder to make solid coal. This laborer mixed the powder with water and then made it into coal balls or coal bricks. That, once dried, would be broken into small pieces for easy burning. Master said, well, the person who used to do the job has gone elsewhere. Do you want to do it? He said, I'm afraid I can't. It's fine if you don't. I do. I do. He was local and believed in Buddha. How can you work with two people supporting you? At this time, the old man got insight and said, one of them is my nephew, the other my son. What if they're not supporting me but working with me? His wife said, can I come too? I can cook for master. At that time, we ate fresh noodles every day. Almost all the local ladies knew how to make that noodle dish. We were so happy that we could eat it every day. Thus, the family of four came to work for us. In the third year, on the birthday of the old man, the son kowtowed to the father, Father, happy birthday to you. Master saw that and said, Why didn't you tell me it's your birthday? I would buy you some wine. My master liked to joke. He said, Oh no, and he thanked my master. Master, when will I finish my work? Why am I still alive? My master became serious. You haven't done enough yet. You have to do eight to ten more years. Understand? Can you imagine how many years? In about 2008, the old man passed away. He'd been doing the chores. If someone asked him to rest, he'd refuse and say, Master asked me to do this work, and I must do it well. He didn't complain. And, usually, he wouldn't speak loudly. He spoke very softly. The old couple had been working together. His wife lived a long life to about 97. She would bring her nephew too. He didn't come every day, but he came very often. Talking about her nephew, he had three children, and all of them went to good schools. He said, I don't have time to take care of them. They got good scores at school all because of him. In Tibetan Buddhism, they won't say it's the blessing of Buddha. They'd say it's the blessing and teaching from their master. So, the nephew was too busy to teach his sons. But his sons were all good, smart and sensible. We've learned that. In Earth Store Bodhisattva's many previous lives, he made the same great vow to save all suffering beings. He's been actually doing that. He's realizing his vow. Master, we're just ordinary beings. Or we're your disciples who have learned from you for a while. Should we learn from Earth Store Bodhisattva to make such great vows? and realize them in Buddhist cultivation. Aspiration is especially important. In fact, looking at people around us, we see many mischievous young people who do no decent work. I've found that most of them don't have a clear life goal to pursue. Without a life goal, they don't know why and for whom they study. If you ask them to do something, they'd ask, why me and not others? Also, they're going through puberty, and don't want to do anything they should do, but want to risk doing what they shouldn't do, especially the evil and bad things that are seemingly challenging. On Earth, there's the Demon King who has many tricks we haven't talked about. The demon king uses his tricks to induce the youth, especially those going through puberty, to do things that they're not supposed to do. Most of those things are harmful and can ruin one's life.
These demon kings are full of evil power, which is actually their attraction. We mentioned before, that when you drink alcohol, especially Chinese wine, it's very spicy, right? The rice wine, be you a man or a woman, after a few drinks, you'd feel like eating chilies, you get used to it and will crave it. After getting used to alcohol, you'll crave spiciness. For a taste that is hard for us to take, once we adapt to it intentionally, since it's not a taste of our regular diet, we're actually craving for its pungency. That's why so many people are attracted to alcohol. These things are arranged by the demon king, a youth or even adults, who are far beyond 25 years old, will get obsessed with something. I discovered in North America, in Vancouver, which has a Chinese community, there are three big casinos. There are all kinds of people in the casino. Some of them are Chinese, who especially love gambling, because it's very attractive. The demon king always wishes for more beings in the six realms. The more for him to rule, the better. You can never get away. The demon king loves to control you and will use all kinds of methods to tempt and cheat you. It creates a force to attract you. How can we get away from such attraction? First of all, you must have a pursuit. I mean, as an ordinary person, say, you want to be a doctor. My mother is so sick and no one can cure her. I want to be a doctor in the future and cure this sickness for my mom and all mothers. What a good wish. If you have such a goal, you'll be motivated to act. You're very likely to study hard, enter a medical school, and become a good doctor to help people. When you have a goal, it'll be your strong motivation. You won't be muddled. You'll figure out what subjects you must do well in to get into a medical school. To be a martial arts master, you need to meet requirements for enrolling in Shaolin Temple, or a martial arts school, or you may find a martial arts master to learn from. You need to meet the requirements, such as being healthy with four limbs and not too stupid, for those who practice martial arts or dance. They have to be diligent. You have to persist and enjoy what you do. Then, you might become a dancer, martial arts elite or martial arts master. When you start doing it, you'll get up early to practice in the morning to improve your physical constitution. You get motivation to pursue a higher level. Learning Buddhism, you have to set your mind. What the Buddha said was quite reasonable. You start to believe, and then you trust, finally, it becomes your belief. What is a belief? It's your whole life and spiritual support. When I feel pain, my belief supports me. When I lose motivation at work, my belief supports me. When I face death, my belief and my Buddha and God protect me. When I make a life choice, my Buddha and God show me the way. When you have a belief, you have power. But it's still not enough, it's just a common belief. Say, the Buddha said, one, you have to make offerings, two, you have to chant. Chanting is practicing dharma, making offerings is to assist dharma practice. Will you follow? If you believe, you follow, right? To follow, is to act. If you say, all right, I do believe in my heart, but I don't act or chant, and I won't make offerings. You don't do anything the Buddha asked you to do. Is that a belief? Of course not, right? If you truly believe, you'll act. To believe, to vow, to act. Because I trust, and it becomes a belief. In fact, the Buddha repeatedly told you that you must have a wish. Say, your wish is very low. In fact, everyone has wishes. 
Say, our smallest wish is, my Buddha, please bless me to get into a good high school. It's a wish of kids, right? The mother's wish, let my kid get into a good school. Let my son find a good wife. Let my daughter get a good husband. To have a happy and peaceful life. You see, everyone has a wish. There are also long-term wishes and short-term wishes. Married housewives wish to have a harmonious, auspicious family. These are all our wishes. If you want to realize your wish, the Buddha said, chant the earth store bodhisattva's holy name 1,000 times daily. Will you chant? The mothers will follow. That's the action. You say you have no money to make offerings. Can you offer your labor? Yes, I can. Where is the Bodhi Meditation Center? If you want to realize your wish, you can't be lazy at work. You can't say, why am I the one working? Why are the others only standing there and ignoring me? No one comes to greet me. No one buys me a drink. And I don't even have a spiritual comfort. If, inside your heart, there's such a wish and pursuit, you won't care if others praise you or not. You won't care what others do to you. Because the wish in your heart is very firm and urgent. Belief itself is based on your need. If your wish is urgent, you can. For example, your beloved husband is seriously ill and staying in the ICU. If you can't find a good doctor and pay for treatment, he might die. You'll become a widow. If you really love your husband and have some savings to pay $800 daily for the hospital, will you pay for it? Yes, if you really love him, you will pay for it. On top of that, you also need to chant 1,000 times daily. Will you do that? Yes. You'll chant even if you need to quit your job. You want to save your husband. It's such an urgent wish that you want to fulfill. Back to the hell theory. As your husband is so sick now, a master says, I can feel that he has heavily sinned. If he doesn't do good deeds, he must go to hell. Those who stole from Buddhist venues must go to the incessant suffering hell and suffer all kinds of punishments. He'll be forever enjoying a non-stop suffering environment. Are you scared? You, being his loved one, of course you're scared. As filial piety children of your parents, will you be scared after hearing this? Yes. Of course. Will you chant 2,000 times daily? Yes. You will. How much savings do you have? One million dollars. Will you donate $800,000 to charity? Yes. Correct. You have to. Because you have this need. And you know it's urgent. Right? So, to act on your wish is not saving the Buddha but yourself. To save your beloved ones. Say, your son doesn't do well at school, and you're sure that he won't be able to get into university. Since your child doesn't study well, Someone introduces you to a super good tutor. The tutor can help your son study and charges 800 US dollars per hour. Being the parents, will you hire such a good tutor? I believe you all will try your best, right? Nowadays, if children can't study at a university, the parents will worry for the rest of their lives. Your children will suffer for a lifetime. Therefore, even if you have to use all your money, you'll help your children to get into university. You'll be willing to make offerings and do volunteer work. That's it. 
To realize our wish, we need to take action. Whether one takes action to realize their wishes, depends on their sense of urgency. According to the Buddhist Sutra, Earth Store Bodhisattva saved his mother twice. When he wasn't a Bodhisattva yet, when she was a little girl, she vowed to save all the beings in the three evil realms. The second time, she was, bright eyes, I vow, making a vow, vows can't be made casually. I want to save all sentient beings. He vowed so deeply that even if he were smashed to pieces, his vow is there and won't be changed. Mine is not as powerful, but now it's been 30 years of my Dharma teaching. It's been 35 years since I made my vow, and I haven't changed. It's not easy, so I didn't change. Challenges have made me stronger. The harder it gets, the tougher I become. It's my life, be it good or bad. I'd rather live following my heart. I'm not changing. When you vow wholeheartedly, for a lifetime, or even several lifetimes, you won't change. Only by that way will you have such persistence, such power, such commitment, and be energized and full of vitality every day. You won't say, I'm so sick, I'm finished, I have to enjoy life. I've never thought like that. I get up early every morning and practice. I teach you Dharma and answer your questions. I have to run the centers. I also have to help people. I do all this every day, and I'm full of energy. But I have to remind you, don't vow immediately after hearing what I said. Your vow should withstand your thoughts. A vow that never changes will create power. Let me tell you a secret of vowing. The bigger the vow is, the more power and wisdom you can have. All enlightened Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, including Guanin and Earth Store, attain their achievements because of their vows. All the younger friends who I've helped know to study hard and be a good person, because I told them, I create my own life. When there's a wish, there's a goal to pursue in life, and they know what to do. You don't need to beat or scold them, they go their way because of the motivation of the wish. Those who used to be troublemakers, rascals or scoundrels, will become nice kids because of their wishes. I persist in teaching Dharma because of my wish. Earth Store Bodhisattva is persisting. It's his wish, just like the Buddha said. If hell is not empty, you won't attain Buddhahood. How many years now? Tens of millions of years. You don't feel annoyed? No, I don't. Every day, he was thinking, there are still so many suffering beings. I need to hurry up to save them. He is busy saving those suffering beings. That's it. When you have such a great vow, gods will protect you. Buddha will bless you and sentient beings will love you. Once you have such a wish, you have limitless power. This is such an important point. And I have told you today. Master, thank you so much for explaining to us the power of wishes. Master, if we chant for the deceased, Will they receive our help and eliminate their bad karma? It's a good question. First of all, I think if you ask this question, you have a bodhisattva heart. I encourage you to chant if you're bodhi karmic connectors. And if you like my teachings, chant to help people who have needs. Some may have obstacles in life, some need to pass an exam, some want to recover from their diseases or pay back a loan sooner. To resolve all kinds of troubles in life, 
All the friends are willing to help others. By chanting the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas' holy name, to eliminate their calamities and accumulate virtues. Also, for the deceased and the dying, who are facing their last trial, let's chant, on behalf of them, to the Buddha and Bodhisattvas for getting guidance to paradise. For those who are scared of falling into evil realms, we chant and pray, so they won't fall into evil realms. We hope that the merits and energy of our chanting can help them eliminate all calamities. This is necessary. I suggest, to all my disciples, and all the friends here who agree with me, that we chant together for everybody. No matter whether we chant for blessings, protection, long life, solutions, or even for helping the dying and the deceased, I suggest that you must chant happily and devotedly. Look at this earth store Bodhisattva Thanka. If you send this to others, I think you're helping them. Then, if you can guide them to listen to my teachings on the Earth Store Sutra, you've saved a family. This is an extremely important and great deed. I want to remind all the friends online. From now on, you'll become a compassionate person. If you really want to, please put your palms together. I'm a compassionate person. I'm a compassionate person. I'm willing to help all beings. I'm willing to help all beings. To gain happiness. To gain happiness. My wish. My wish. Will last forever. Will last forever. And will never change. And will never change. That's okay. Thank you, Master. After making this vow, many who thought they didn't have wisdom, will have the wisdom to help others once they've vowed. Let me tell you, if the vow you made just now is true, gods and deities who are watching, will begin to protect you. Just like that, deities start protecting you. As a matter of fact, the more people we help, the faster we gain wisdom and liberation. That's the fastest way to get enlightened. Helping others is helping ourselves. You shouldn't care for the merits gained from helping others. You're just helping yourselves. And, when you leave this world, do you know where to go? You don't know, indeed. From now on, you re-examine yourself and you'll help others with your genuine compassion. All right. Please join me and put your hands together. Namo Earth Store Bodhisattva. Namo Earth Store Bodhisattva. Namo Earth Store Bodhisattva. The merit I gain from teaching on the Earth Store Bodhisattva Sutra. I'm willing to dedicate it to the Dharma realm, to benefit all the beings in the human world, heaven, and six realms. Whether they have forms or not, may all beings be liberated. I wish you all a healthy and happy life. Received. Have a happy family. Received. May all your beautiful wishes come true. Thank you, Master.
下的红点里，人生就此欢喜。我快乐了，我健康了，我幸福了，我美丽了。在茫茫人海之中，让我与你相遇。小小的红点滴，人生变得神奇。我智慧了，我宽容了，我慈悲了，我自在了。因为有了你，生命变得更坚。下的红点里，人生就此欢喜。我快乐了，我健康了，我幸福了，我美丽了。在茫茫人海之中，让我与你相遇。小小的红点里。人生变得神奇，我智慧了，我宽容了，我慈悲了，我自在了。因为有了你，生命变得更坚定，不忧忧郁郁。因为有。不再有哭泣，不再有恐惧。
小小的红点里，人生就此欢喜。我快乐了，我健康了，我幸福了，我美丽了。在茫茫人海之中，让我与你相遇。小小的红点滴，人生变得神奇。我智慧了，我宽容了，我慈悲了，我自在了。因为有了你，生命变得更坚定，不忧。不再有哭泣，不再。